All right. Well, as Derek said, I'm, I'm moderating and I'm just so excited to get started. I, I heard uh, how to work with jerks with Eric just recently. And then if you didn't get a chance, please check out uh, Jason's uh, talk on a culture of trust, building and retaining cybersecurity teams. It's just a, such a unique uh, and great time to also speak about building, like what do we do in terms of building and creating uh, cybersecurity organizations and teams with a, such a great panel. Enough about me. I'm joined by three awesome leaders in the cybersecurity space, uh, and I'd love to have you introduce yourselves. So first off, let's get uh, order on my screen. Deirdre, why don't you go first? Yeah, hi. Good morning or good afternoon, depending where everybody is. So good to see your faces, ladies. I know. Hi, Tanisha. Uh, it's been too long since I've seen you. Um, and it's great to be here with you all. I am uh, Deidre Diamond. I'm the founder of Secure Diversity. Uh, Secure Diversity is about five years old, and we work to support women coming into cybersecurity as well as women already in cybersecurity and career development. We're one of the co-founders of the Day of security event, which is a free event. Uh, it's a great conference, 1100 women, the last three conferences we've had, red team, blue team, GRC conversation, and EQ, emotional intelligence track for management. So it's great conference and uh, love to have all of you involved. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm also the founder of CyberSN, which is the largest cyber staffing firm in the US. It's good to be with you. Awesome. Well, thanks, Deidre. Uh, next up, let's go in alphabetical order at this point. And it's also the second one on my screen. Keenan, go ahead. I think you're muted, Keenan. Someone has to do it. it it's it, no, someone it's okay. has to. So <laughs> that moment when you have multiple screens and you lose your mouse on one of them and you're like, ah, where did you go? You were just right there. So that's me in a nutshell. Um, Keenan Skelly, I'm the CEO of Spark Solutions, uh, which does consulting for a variety of things in cybersecurity, uh, including management and uh, strategy for upcoming cyber startups and cyber companies. And recently I just founded um, the XR Village, which is very exciting. And I'm uh, doing some cool stuff with that. Tanisha's like, yes, because we're going to partner and do some amazing stuff. Um, Background is crazy. Um, used to blow stuff up, used to work at DHS. Now I just really like, um, you know, helping folks in cybersecurity. So that's it. Tanisha, good luck following someone who used to blow stuff up. I mean, that was. I know. <laughs> how, do you, how do you follow up? Like, I used to blow up stuff. Like, I blow up software. I don't know. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, my name is Tanisha Martin. I am the executive director of Black Girls Hack. Um, I am a penetration tester. Um, I tell the folks in Black Girls Hack that I mind other people's business for a living because I am all about pushing for world domination and for people to achieve their best um, lives. I am also the founder of the Girls Hack Village. Um, we just uh, premiered our first uh, village at DEF CON this year, which is awesome and amazing. And we have an uh, awesome lineup for next year as well. So I'm excited to be here. Awesome. And folks, I forgot the biggest best question of all. It is lunchtime. I see folks are joining during their lunchtime. Um, just, just to break the ice a little bit more, what's your favorite lunchtime food? Or I'm traveling soon, so I can't wait to just get all the foods again since we've been kind of inside for a while. Let's just, let's just share. Uh, just go around the room again. Deirdre, what's, what's your favorite food? You know, let's get hungry. Let's get hungry for psychological so safety, but also some food later. Yes, brilliant minds, all of us. What do we eat? Uh, I like to eat a lot of egg sandwiches. <laughs> I just had one. There's a restaurant in Boston called Tate, and I just went there not too long ago. It's the best egg sandwich I've ever had. <laughs> so that's my my guilty pleasure of the day. Well, good. All right, Keenan. What what are you eating? What are you snacking on behind your two monitors here? Oh my God. Um, so. There's going to be haters, okay? And I'm okay with that. I don't really care. But I am a pickle snacker, like all oh. day, every day. Eat the pickle, drink the pickle juice. Like that is my go-to snack during the day. 
and I typically don't eat breakfast. So it's like pickle snacks, pickle snacks, pickle snacks, pickle snacks, and then dinner. Just perfect. Okay. Day. Blowing stuff up and pickles. I, I can't wait for this <laughs> panel. I mean, we didn't cover this. Everyone, you're hearing this live. Um, and I, I guess word, word to anyone who's meeting her coming up, bring a pickle jar. Tanisha, go on ahead. Um, so strangely enough, eggs um, sandwiches are my number two favorite, but my number one um, are is um, ribeye steaks. I did not eat meat for 18 years. Um, and then when I started back having uh, steaks and I had a ribeye, I was like, why did I ever leave you? I love you. So now like I will randomly post like ribeye steaks on my uh, social media because like that's who I am. Welcome back to the meat. <laughs> oh, thank back. you. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm getting hungry. Now we got for more haters. Everyone. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hungry i i'm i'm thinking about how we're gonna do a meal later egg sandwiches uh pickles and rib ribeyes but either way we're hungry i hope everyone else is hungry not only for this but psychological safety and let's just get right into it what psychological safety is a sounds pretty academic you know, we have to Google it. A, uh, Harvard Business Review just sent out a tip of what is psychological safety today. So it's almost as if the worlds are colliding here. But it seems pretty academic. What does psychological safety mean to you? And um, go on, go on and just anyone who wants to start. I just laughed out loud. I think it's fascinating that somebody doesn't know what that means, you know, like I, I could barely handle the leader saying I'm not technical. So therefore it's hard to manage technical people. It drives me crazy that now we don't know what psychological safety that means. Uh, that being said, uh, it means so it's such a serious thing that it's a national security issue. I see it every day at scale in our jobs and careers data that I look at regularly uh, across the United States. And we have um, you know, worse and worse retention statistics and happiness levels of our cyber professionals. And, um, and that's a vulnerability in itself. And so uh, there aren't many cultures, in my opinion, that know how to produce psychological safety. It is a skill that most have not been trained on to the defense of, uh, of all of our <laughs> companies out there. So that being said, it's a major problem. And I'm really excited to talk about solutions. And yet it really means that somebody can be at work and speak their mind and um, not be persecuted, bullied, judged, uh, fired, demoted, just for sharing their concerns, their thoughts, their ideas. Uh, it, it, they ought to be comfortable to speak. And um, uh, and that's very rare today. Yeah, it's that comfort and that confidence. It's and it, it it's pretty unique too in terms of it's a qualitative measure that most of us don't necessarily learn. Uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Tanisha. What? How do you create, or how would you create something like that, like a safe space, but also helping others feel confident in that space, even when you make it. So um, I, I think I know a lot of the, the ladies um, on this panel just from like past, um, we, we are all, I think, fighting a similar fight in terms of diversity, trying to increase diversity in cybersecurity, trying to get diversity of thoughts, um, of, of approaches to problem solving, right? But um, I think the one thing that we don't tend to focus on a lot as a, as a whole is once we get the women into into these spaces once we get the minorities into the spaces how do we make them feel safe so that they can actually stay there right because it's it's one thing to say hey yeah we allow you know women into the space or we allow you know all of these things we're a diverse hey, organization hey, we allow we allow we encourage encourage we encourage women <laughs> we encourage women to to be into this space but like once they get there do they feel safe um adding value to the organizations in letting their voices be heard to, you know, bring up, you know, something that may not be, you know, something that everybody agrees on. Um, and, I, and I think that that psychological safety is, you know, one of the things that we need to, as an industry, focus on to let women be able to exist um, and continue um, their careers in cybersecurity. So that for me, that's that's what we need to focus on is people being comfortable enough to be themselves and be able to add the value um, the way that they truly will be able to once they're they're comfortable. 
And Kanan, you brought up a good point. It's not just allowing, it's also on us as we think, am I allowed to, do I have permission to, right? It's more, well, I should be here. I, I'm yeah. welcome here. I should be. What are you thinking? Never ask for permission. Always ask for forgiveness. I mean, maybe always ask for forgiveness. You know, I, I grew up as an, an adult, I grew up in a world that was very much in, in EOD or explosive ordnance disposal. It was totally a male dominated space. And one of the things that I didn't have that maybe I should have was a care about what they thought, right? Because it was all about safety in that circumstance, right? I don't want to die. So I'm going to tell you every little thing that I think about what you're doing right now. And what are you going to do? Fire me? I'm in the army. Good luck with that. So I think having that kind of background made me a little bit more prepared for the tech world where a lot of times there are folks in this industry, there are leaders in this industry who don't know how to check their own ego at the door and don't know how to say, this isn't about me. This isn't about me as the CEO. This isn't about me as a thought leader. This is about my team because they are the ones who are doing everything every single day. And if they're not happy, if they don't feel like they're a part of the conversation, if they don't feel like they're growing, if they don't feel like they have a path, they're not going to want to be there. And for all of these old school CEOs who are coming from a world where, you know, you should be thankful that you have a job and, um, you know, you should be thankful that you're getting a, an unpaid internship so you can bring me coffee. Uh, those, those days are gone. They're gone. And now being in the job market, being in cybersecurity means being competitive. So check your ego at the door and make sure that the people that are around you are happy with their jobs and fulfilled. I've actually, I've actually had someone tell me um, that I should be thankful to be making the salary that I, I'm making when I, you know, was requesting a, uh, a raise. Um, and like that, when you said that, I was just like, oh, but again, like if, if somebody tells you that you should be grateful to be somewhere, you know, it's, it's hard to be able to bring your full self. Right. Because it's like, you know, does that mean that this is in question if, if, you know, you don't see my value. But you know what the time is, it's time for you to look for a new job. <laughs> if you have somebody, you know, saying that to you, when you're asking for growth, when you're asking to, you know, be a little bit more aggressive in your own career and helping the company, then it's time to look for a new job because there is no psychological safety there. You're in a situation where that leader is taking advantage of all of the things that you really want to be doing for the company and want to do because they're the right things to do. Yeah, I'd like to add something here. You know, this the the challenge as to why it's worse or women are dealing with this at such a high level is because also the men do not have mental safety in out in their daily work lives too. Meaning the stats of retention being so poor are mostly men, since it's mostly men in the business. And so when I look out there at language, I just I just decided that I'm going to coin um, uh, word pollution. <laughs> you know, words that come out of our mouths and that type out of our fingers are the things that are causing all of these problems that don't foster mentally safe cultures. And because men don't have the language down of how to interact well, uh, it's even worse because that language doesn't work on women because we didn't grow up interacting with men in that capacity. And then, you know, and so it's just this, everybody's searching for uh, success and yet they don't have the words and the skills to do what Keenan is talking about, which is treat your team well. You just got to get performance and don't even know how to get performance out of people without thinking they work for you. And this is the, this is the skill set that's lacking in managers right now. And that's causing, say, uh, you know, environments not to be safe, people to get yelled at, uh, bullied in front of other employees. Like I hear it all the time. It's just terrible. Like people leave people, they don't leave companies. Yeah. They leave people. And that's the challenge that we're having. They you leave up a good point. Oh, good. Yeah, totally. And on that note, I, I just want to add, you know, about psychological safety. I think that, you know, as we try to understand why people leave jobs in general, 
or why people want to go to a place. I think we overuse the word psychological safety in that it should just be about safety, right? Mm -hmm. Across the board, you should feel safe to be who you are. You should feel safe to show up every day and give your best. You should feel safe in a meeting to say, no, that's bullshit. And here's why. General safety is, is the bigger part of this. And I do think, Deidre, to your point, that it goes to everyone. I think, unfortunately, women are more adversely affected by it. Yeah, without a doubt, without a doubt. I mean, the, the, the glass ceiling truly exists. That's, the, that's what it is. And that's why how we show up more affected by it is that we get less powerful roles, power in money, power in just making things happen. And, and while it's changing, it's slow. And it's because they men don't know how to do it themselves. They're running everything. I always keep saying that we need you guys, you know, to figure out how to even work with each other at a greater capacity. Never mind with uh, women and other genders. It's a it's a skill. You know, you bring up a good point. You said earlier, you know, people are, you know, these leaders are also. Don't, they don't know uh, how to how to create the space. Or, for instance, I like to call folks who are just behind the keyboard slack attackers, where they might not know the empathy that's or what they're causing because they're behind a screen, maybe not showing up on video, and they're causing some distress on the other side. Um, I'd love to pose this question: Does anyone want to share? Um, you know, and and please leave out whatever details you'd like but share a time where you had kind of those cringing experiences where you just wish someone heard you or there's an ally or an advocate and and please share with the audience what would you want to have seen or have done because i think that's where we need to start educating and creating that you know we're all building building teams with strangers here so how would you want to be seen and maybe those are some st steps forward in terms of acting for some of, for some of our audience I'm going to just jump in. <laughs> so I think that, you know, if I look back across my entire career, whether it was army or government or tech specific, you know, there's always these examples. And I think that many of us can relate to that. You know, there's always going to be people who don't trust what you're doing and they, they make you feel the guilt of, of maybe I'm not good enough. There's a reason imposter syndrome is a thing, and it's a thing for everybody because it sucks. And very often we're made to feel as human beings like we're not enough for whatever it is. And especially women, because we're like, we're super empathic about that, right? We're like, oh my God, maybe I'm terrible. Maybe, maybe I'm a jerk face. Oh my gosh, what do I do? What do I do? Um, and it takes other folks around you, other allies to help build that system up. I think it's super important, you know, it has been in my life um, where you you fail a couple of times in bringing up the fact that you don't agree with something, right? Where you're asking for the seat at the table and they say no, and you're like, well, screw you, I'm taking a seat at the table, or as Tanisha likes to call it, world domination. <laughs> and so I have a lot of experiences where I've been dressed down by officers who think they're in charge of an incident and they're not because I'm there to make sure they live through it, or, you know, tech CEOs who think that it's totally okay to belittle their employees and tell them, you know, you shouldn't have to deal with these things. It's very complicated. Okay. Thank, thank you for that. I, thank you. It is complicated. I understand that. But I would like to empower every person, women, men, everyone to say, no, that's actually not, I, it's like, I see what you're bringing back to me with this hate and discontent. But what I'm trying to say is actually for the business. So let's focus on that. Let's focus on for the betterment of what's happening here. And I think that unfortunately, a lot of times women don't have the, the ability or the experience to do that. I've been it's super lucky that I got, you know, hazed and all kinds of horrible, horrible things. <laughs> and I say lucky because it prepared me for the tech world where they don't necessarily know that they're being assholes, but they're being assholes. And sometimes you gotta be able to just say that, look, you're being uncool right now. Okay, just no, just no. Let's talk this through. 
So I, I've got an example kind of like piggybacking off of that. Um, there will be times where, you know, I'm in a meeting and then I'll say, hey, you know, I think that we should do this to approach this problem. And, you know, people will be like, oh, you know, no, no, no. And then like maybe 20 minutes later, somebody male will say, hey, I think we should do this same thing that you just said 20 minutes ago. And then everybody's like, oh, yeah, let's go with that. Right. Um, and then for me, you know, it'll be the people who come to me after the meeting and say, you know, hey, um, you know, I like the way that, you know, this person's said the same thing you did 20 minutes later and it was accepted and thought it was a good idea. And I think that that's great, but say something during the meeting, right? Because if I say to you, like, I just said that, like, it, it, am I imagining that I just said that 20 minutes ago? I'm, I'm often seen as, you know, hostile or, you know, um, you know, angry black woman. Right. Um, but you, uh, the other people in the room also see it. Right. And they say to me, like, after in private, like, Hey, I saw that. Right but you're not speaking up, right? And I, I think the one thing that we're missing um, in the workspace is, I guess, public uh, sponsors, public allies, um, people who are willing to step up and say, hey, this is not right, right? Because when I say it, it's just like, oh, well, you know, that's your own personal problem, right? Um, mm -hmm. But if somebody else says it, then it may be taken a little bit more seriously, right? So, you know, I think that part of that safety is like, hey, you know, you're not imagining this. Somebody just said the same exact thing you did. Um, and, you know, let's let's circle back on that, right? You know, I thought that was a great idea when Tanisha mentioned it 20 minutes ago, right? Say that in the meeting, right? Because that I think helps to validate, you know, what it is that I'm bringing that's obviously being ignored. That ignoring piece, let's just touch on that more because I think that we don't know it, we feel it, but it's all often hard to like, hello, look at me. I'm, I'm doing great things. You know, it also tags into uh, just what Keenan mentioned about imposter syndrome. What, how do we, gosh, it gets tiring always having to raise my own hand or look like, I guess I'm going to do it myself all over again. I'm doing it or I'm, we are doing it. Let's, let's talk more about what, how, Aside from psychological psychological safety, one of the out outcomes is imposter syndrome. If we don't feel safe, how do we define that and also just go through it and kind of say imposter syndrome? Yeah, that's nice. Psychological safety. I'm choosing this going forward. Um, maybe dear, uh, touching on that a little bit with secure diversity in your work there. Oh wait, you're muted. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. I took a deep sigh and then I said, uh, you know, imposter syndrome is a result of societal norms for women in particular, uh, again, also for men, men get bullied and have hierarchy in their interactions uh, on the playground and at work uh, too. Uh, and so, uh, you know, when I think about imposter syndrome, I think about, you know, women weren't trained from school, young age, all the way to be, uh, you know, powerful. Some of us got lucky and somebody along the way empowered us and told us to be powerful. And and then there's scales of that. And so, you know, this is where we are in society. I mean, look what just happened in the Supreme Court. You know, women aren't deemed bright enough or capable enough to determine what's, you know, good for their own bodies. And, uh, and so we're still living in an era where women have it very, a very challenged time to be powerful, to be deemed equal. And we know that the mind, the way that it works is 99% of the time we're running a subconscious program. And so we waking up that subconscious program to a conscious thinking is the only solution to moving forward. And that's going to be like we're all talking about having allies, people speaking up in meetings, people requiring their organizations to take you know, culture, seriously, culture isn't about ping pong tables and free food. Culture ought to be about empowering humans to live their best lives and enjoy work and, and prosper in happiness uh, as much as, you know, a, a career, uh, you know, and, and so, and so we have to, we have to really, you know, wake ourselves up because we're living in patterns and we see it in just what just happened, you know. 
to me. It speaks volumes. So I, I think that um, imposter syndrome, like there's there's two different views of the world, right? There's the view that we see from kind of like within our heads, and then there's the outside, you know, people looking in, right? So when people look at me, they're like, how could you possibly have, you know, imposter syndrome, you're X, Y, Z, right? Mm -hmm. But when I'm looking, and I'm, I'm in my head and I'm looking out, you yeah. know, it's like, well, there's like, Keenan out here who's like literally blowing up things and so many other, you know, bad ass women, I hope I can say that, um, that are out here doing like amazing things. And it's just like, you know, how can, like, how can this be reality? Do, do I deserve to be there? Do I, you know, so those, I think those I'm feelings. I'm right now, you're a badass bitch, okay? <laughs> <laughs> badass boss bitch, I've been told. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But I mean, it, I don't think it changes, right? Like no matter like how long you go along your way, like I feel like in the back of your mind that still exists, right? So it's like, you have to change the way that you, I guess, look on the outside, not so much the way that other people look at, at you, right? So it, it's all internal, like the way that you you view the world. I, I have to agree 100%. Um, again, through transitioning through an all-male military space and an all-male government space and then an all-male tech space where, uh, you know, the ideology is very much similar, I adapted very early in my life that I would be unapologetically fearless because I need to be, because I have to be, because otherwise no one is going to give you the opportunity to do this. And that's some bullshit, right? <laughs> when we know that there are other people, other demographics who do get given things. So we do work harder and it's unfortunate to have to say that, but it's true. And along with that, I think it's important to get up every day and look yourself in the mirror and say, unapologetically fearless, world domination. I'm going to do it. And it's not about them. It's about me. It's about my crew. It's about the people I'm trying to represent. And it's about making sure they have a voice, no matter what. Making sure we have a voice and others do. What a great segue, Keenan, to something that I think is all near and dear to our heart, share the mic in cyber. And, you know, I think it's going to say show of hands if we all know about it. I think we all do. Uh, but more importantly, you know, stemming off of what you were saying, why do we participate in Share the Mic in Cyber? And what, is it, what does this campaign mean to you, uh, especially if you've been a repeat participant? I will jump in there um, because I have done, um, this is my third time um, coming up this October will be my third time. Um, and it's been absolutely amazing. So for anybody who's not familiar with Share the Mic in, in Cyber, it's like the brainchild of uh, is Caitlin, um, Camille and Lauren. Um, and they put it together and it's supposed to be a way for um, allies to partner with black cybersecurity practitioners to um, amplify their voice. So for two days a year, I think one of them is in maybe in March and one's in October, you basically partner with um, a, you know, your ally. And for that day, you take over their social media and they talk about you for the entire day. So to lift your voice, to amplify what it is that you're trying to do, to give you a greater profile than you would normally have in your day-to-day -day life. Right. And, you know, some people, you know, are always like, well, I don't know if I want to do this. And I, I tell people, especially within my organization, like, I don't care what else you do with your life. You need to participate and share the mic and cyber because it, there's so many awesome, awesome um, outcomes that come from participating in that program. I watched one of my friends, um, Talia, last year take over um, the director of the NSA's um, social media page. And when you go to their Twitter and you go to like their LinkedIn page, like you just saw her face like sitting there and like, to this day, I still get chills because like that was like one of the most epic things that I've ever seen, like in the history of ever. And it's it it increases the profile, you know, not just of what you're doing personally, but the causes that are important to you. So for me, that's that's Black Girls Hack. That's increasing diversity in cybersecurity. It gives me a greater voice and a greater platform than I could probably ever hope to have myself. Um, and, and for me, that's why it's 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 so important. Obviously, I'm very excited about it. Um, I I love share the mic in cyber. Like I will participate until they decide to kick me out. Um, <laughs> And I've taken over the world and they're going to be like, you don't need to participate anymore. You're at the top of the world. I'm still going to be like, but you guys need to let me in. So oh, you're taking everyone with you <laughs> as we, as we have this world domination. Absolutely. And absolutely. No, what I love is that you, you mentioned this before. You're not only a practitioner, but you're also signing up as an ally because we can do both. We are 
lifting and raising as we go. Uh, Keenan, I see you're you're nodding. I know we've worked together on on this campaign in the past. Why do you still do it? So for me, you know, it kind of goes back to my history of of all of these things that I've done where I saw no representation of anything other than white dude. And no offense, white dudes, I like you. I do, most of you. But, you know, we keep talking about skills deficit and the skills gap, and we're not getting people involved in this. We're not getting people involved in that. And as somebody who's been involved with cyber education for a long time, I'm so confused because there are so many people out there who are interested. There's so many different types of folks who are out there who are like, oh my God, I want to learn more. I spend every night on YouTube looking at, you know, how to use Kali Linux and how to like break into stuff. And I really want to do this as a living, but they're not being heard and they're not being looked at. And that is not, it's no bueno. So <laughs> I think what we have to do as people, women, um, minorities of any kind in cybersecurity, what we have to do is help each other. That That is the most crucial thing that we can do because it's us who already have a little bit of a stage who can say, okay, take this stage for me, take it and run with it. Tanisha, take this and take over the world, go. That's how we build up community. That's how we build up resilience. That's how we build up a world where women, minorities do not leave their jobs as soon as they get them. They stay because they are recognized as regular everyday human beings. And they can show up authentically, bring their whole selves and et cetera from here. Deirdre, did you want to say something? I saw you go on and off. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm uh, new to the program between CyberSN and Secure Diversity and our own event. It's uh, difficult to participate in everything. However, at DOS, as Tanisha knows, we ask, we give not-for-profits free booths and we want to help spread the word. And we do a lot of supporting other not-for-profits. WESIS is out there, Cyber Jitsu is out there. There are amazing organizations. And so I like to think of Secure Diversity, one of the originals to sort of helps you know, get everybody together or at least steer everybody certain ways to find each other because we all have different offerings that we have to give to the community. Uh, but it sounds like it's one that I need to go experience based on Tanisha and Keenan's uh, experience. So I, I will make sure I do. I Can I also add, and I think this is super important, you know, uh, Tanisha and I have worked together on a couple of different things. And, you know, I try to amplify her as much as possible. And I know she tries to amplify other people. And we both try to amplify racists. And we both try to amplify Women's Society of Cyber Jutsu. And this is something that's unique about a woman's community is that we want to bring everybody in. We're like, hey, you do this? Come on, let's go. Be a part of my village. Be a part of this so we can talk about this problem together and make change together. And that's something that's so not normal <laughs> in the space right now. And I think it's crucial, which is why I think Share the Mic and Cyber is really, it's everything. It's all about that collaboration. It's all about that sharing. It's all about, I have resources, you need resources. How can we help each other? Yeah, I, I, I just want to piggyback on that um, because like when I, when I first started Black Girls Hack, um, you know, I had this this worldview that, hey, can't we all work together? And like, can't we all promote each other? There's enough shine, there's enough um, money, there's enough, you know, uh, everything out there for us all to work together and all succeed and, and all win. And, you know, it was, I was surprised when I found other organizations or other people individually that, you know, didn't have that same view, that kind of viewed things like, you know, if you're winning, then that means I can't be winning. And like, I, I'm not talking about participation trophies. I'm talking about there's enough of everything out there for all, us all to win. And we're stronger together. We can work on our collective voices. And, you know, that's one of the reasons it, it is, uh, uh, National uh, Hispanic Heritage Month. I think that's correct. Um, and you know why we're lifting up uh, Raices this this month because you know again this is an organization that's trying to increase diversity. There's no reason why we can't help support other people work together, you know, collectively so that we can take over the world together. You know, and you know for anybody who runs an organization who's a part of join all of the organizations. There's nothing that says that you can't be in all of these organizations. Like Deidre, Deidre said, um, there are so many different activities, different offerings each of these organizations 
does. So like join all the organizations, participate, you know, increase your network so that you can be able to, you know, be a part of all these different um, resources and take over the world together. It's not a competition. Right. Taking over the world and in the spirit of acting, I think we've plugged sign up, uh, sign up to share the mic in cyber. You can see some links in the chats here. I think we plugged a lot of the great, awesome organizations. As Tanisha said, you don't have to belong to one, join all. But in the closing minutes, what is the best way to, for folks to get in touch with you? Uh, I think this is part of that visibility and amplifying. I think we can all, uh, you know, how can all of the attendees and folks watching get in touch with you and, sh and share your, uh, what you're doing with others? I'm a big LinkedIn gal, so <laughs> easiest is LinkedIn for me, and I love uh, helping, so don't, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, LinkedIn also, um, I'm at uh, Miss Tanisha on Twitter. Um, so feel free to reach out to me on Twitter and uh, LinkedIn. And of course, um, at Black Girls Hack. Um, you don't have to be Black or a girl um, to join us. We've got a whole bunch of people who are, you know, none of those things. So like, please feel free to, to join us and come hack all of the things. I, you know, I'm old now. And I really like LinkedIn is extra for me. It's like extra work. Um, so Twitter, totally for me, at Keenan Skelly, at XR Village, at the National Blast, if you want to learn about policy and legislation and cybersecurity. And um, yeah, don't just don't message me on LinkedIn. There's a high probability I'm never going to answer that ever. You know, it's usually the flip of like, I'm old now, I'm not on Twitter. You're like, no, 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 don't, uh, you know, the, the, the LinkedIn DMs is the trap. Don't go there. <laughs> the trap it's all advertising now ah that's right well everyone thank you so much for sharing for for not only sharing the mic i i get it i've said it enough but also sharing your thoughts here we are truly just building teams and communities from strangers and it's really a testament to creating space and safety for all um to feel confident and feel like they belong <laughs>